Amen. Amen. So before I get started, one thing I forgot to mention during announcements was um, the late the restrooms. The ladies' restroom is back here. That's reserved for the ladies and young children only. And we just ask that all the men use the outside. It's also it's very nice, but it's just it's located outside. There's that key there with the big giant wooden blocks so that it doesn't water off to San Diego or where else? Sacramento, I think, is where I ended up last night. So anyway, that's a long story for another time. I wanted to preach this morning. Uh, the title of this morning's sermon is uh, "False Doctrine Concerning Baptism." Of course, we're having a baptism today, and you know, it's it's something that whenever it comes up, it causes me to think about baptism. And you know, forgive the pun. If you think it's a dry subject, you know. Don't forget that the name on the door out there is Faithful Word Baptist Church. So we should definitely have an understanding of what baptism is and what it isn't um, because we're Baptists. And uh, that's what I want to preach to you about this morning is the false doctrines concerning baptism. So beginning there in Colossians chapter 2, look at verse 1 where the Bible reads, For I would, uh, I would, for I would that you knew what great conflict I have for you and for them at Laodicea, and for as many as not seen me my face in the flesh, that their hearts might be comforted, being knit together in love, and unto all riches of the uh, of riches of the full assurance of understanding, to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God and of the Father and of Christ, in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And this I say, lest any man should beguile you with enticing words. So Paul is saying here that the reason he's writing these things is because in verse four, lest any man should beguile you with enticing words. If you look down there in verse 8, he repeats this warning. He says, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. And really, baptism falls into this category where there are those out there that would use vain deceit, that they would use the tradition of men in order to deceive us, in order to uh, get us off course in regards to the subject of salvation and what it takes to be saved. And Paul's well aware of the fact that there are false prophets out there, and that's why he's taking the time to warn these people uh, that there are false prophets out there that are going to preach another gospel. If you would, turn over to Galatians chapter 1. This is a common theme and a common concern that Paul had for, uh, for people, is that they would not be deceived by a false gospel, that they would not be deceived through the tradition of men, through vain deceit, through enticing words. He didn't want them to be beguiled. The Bible says, and you're going to uh, Galatians 1, but it says in 2 Corinthians, but I fear lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if ye receive another spirit which we have not, ye have not received, or another gospel which ye have not accepted, ye might be, uh, well bear with him. So this is a concerning head, that somebody else would bring another gospel, that they would bring another spirit, and that these people would be beguiled, that they would be taken away from the simplicity that is in Christ. Look there in Galatians chapter 1 and verse 6 where it says, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. So you can see that Paul's fears are not unfounded. He's, seeing, he's addressing these people and saying, I marvel at you. He's amazed at the fact that they are so soon removed. It's already begun to happen. They've been removed from him that have called, uh, called, uh, from him that called you into the grace of Christ. They've been called from the, the, the true salvation that's in Christ unto what? Unto another gospel. Which is not another, it says in verse 7. But there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we or an angel from heaven should we, uh, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. That's a strong language to use for somebody that would preach another gospel. Let that man be accursed, Paul said. We have to understand how, how important of a subject the gospel is. It's the most important yep. subject there is. Amen. It means he literally means heaven and hell. Yep. It's the difference between life and death. And that's why we see Paul giving such strong admonitions to not allow themselves to be beguiled, to not allow themselves to be enticed and moved on to another gospel. His warnings are not without merit. If you would, turn over to 2 Peter chapter 2. 2 Peter chapter 2. I'll share with you from Jude chapter 1 as you're going to 2 Peter chapter 2 where the Bible reads, for there are certain men crept in unawares 
who were before of old ordained to this condemnation. Ungodly men, turning the grace of our Lord God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God, our uh, only Lord God, and our Lord Jesus Christ. So again, more warnings of men creeping in, false prophets that would preach another gospel. Look at Second Peter chapter two, in uh, verse one. But there were false prophets among, also among the people. Nothing's changed. There's no new thing under the sun as it was back then. So it is today. Yep. There were false prophets among, uh, also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you. He didn't say there might be. He didn't say there could be. He didn't say there's a strong possibility. No, he said there shall be false teachers among you who, shall pri who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction, and many shall follow their pernicious ways, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. Again, just more strong warnings that evil men and seducers are going to creep in and teach another gospel. And this isn't Paul just flying off the handle. This isn't Paul just ranting and raving. These are the exact warning that Christ himself gave us. He said in Matthew 7, Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. It's a strong warning from the Lord. Amen. And what makes a false prophet a false prophet this morning? Basically, if we were to boil it all down to every single false prophet that is out there, they basically teach one thing, and that is salvation by works. That is one of the biggest, that is the heresy that they want to promote. Right. That in order for you to go to heaven, you have to live a good life, right. you have to keep the commandments, you have to be a good person, you have to repent of your sins. They come at it with all these different angles to get you away from the simplicity that is in Christ, to call you away from the grace that is in Christ Jesus unto another gospel, a gospel of works. And some make no attempt to veil that fact. They make it as plain as day. We go out and we've, we've knocked doors and knocked doors and asked people plainly, what do you think a person has to do to go to heaven? Be a good person. That's right. No. Be baptized. Keep the commandments. All of these things. They'll say things like, uh, you know, keep the sacraments. That's a big one. Well, I'm Catholic. I believe I have to keep the sacraments in order to go to heaven. The Mormon church teaches living a good life. I mean, how many Mormons will say that? Well, you have to, James chapter 2. You know, you have to keep, you have to, uh, faith without works is dead, they'll say. <clears throat> Some are more subtle, and they will mask this false doctrine. They do this by making the things that we ought to do into things that we must do. Now, should we keep the commandments? Yes. Absolutely. We should strive to keep them. But here's the thing. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Amen. Right? We're condemned already, the Bible says. If we believe not on the Lord, it, you know, we are condemned already. The wrath of God already, already abides upon us because we've already broken the commandments. We're already guilty before God. So to sit there and say, well, I'm going to keep the commandments, I'm going to do good works and work my way to heaven, you'll never pay it back. The debt is too much. <clears throat> Some are more subtle and they mask their false doctrine by saying there's things we ought to do and making those things that we must do. If you would, uh, go over to uh, 2 John chapter 1. 2 John chapter 1. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10, For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. I mean, when we got saved, we got born again, we put our faith in Christ for salvation, we were created in Christ Jesus unto good works. That we should, it goes on and says, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. There are good works that God wants us to do. God wants us to love our neighbor as ourselves. God wants us to not commit adultery. God wants us to not be fornicators. God wants us to not be drunkards. God wants us to not turn the grace of our God into lasciviousness, as we read earlier. But those are things that we should do. There's only one thing we must do in order to go to heaven. <clears throat> You're there in 2 John verse one. Look at uh, chapter 1, excuse me, look at verse 6. And this is love that we walk after His commandments. This is the commandment, that as ye have heard from the beginning, ye should, ye should walk in it. We should walk in His commandments because we love Him. He said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Yep. He didn't say, if you want to go to heaven, keep my commandments. Right. If you would turn over to Gal uh, Galatians uh, chapter 6. Galatians chapter 6. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 3, My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, neither be weary of His correction. 
For whom the Lord loveth, he correcteth, even as a father, the son in whom he delighteth. So I'm quoting that because I want to address a common accusation that gets thrown our way as those that would believe that salvation is by grace through faith and not of works, lest any man should boast. As it says in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. They'll say, well, you're teaching that you can live however you want and go to heaven. And I say amen to that. Right. Absolutely I am. Amen. Because it's not by works of righteousness which we have done, but by His grace He saved us. Right. It's not about the fact that I gave my life for Christ. It's the fact that He gave His life for me right. that I'm going to heaven. I'm not going to hold up the, righteous, my, the filthy rag of my own righteousness and say, I work my way into heaven. Right. Lest any man should boast. That's why it is the gift of God. Lest any man should boast. <clears throat> So people will say, well, you're saying you can live however you want and go to heaven. And to that, again, I say amen. But what they misconstrue us as saying is saying that we're saying you can live however you want without consequences. Right. That's not what we're saying right. at all. You, it says it right there. My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, neither be weary of his correction. For whom the Lord loveth, he correcteth, even yeah. as a father with a son in whom he delighteth. And that's repeated in Hebrews chapter 12. That God chastens every son whom he receiveth. Yeah. So yes, I'm saying you can live however you want and go to heaven if your faith is in Christ alone for salvation. But I'm not saying you can go out and live however you want and not suffer the consequences in this life. Right. To be just like my child here, my, one of my kids, if they misbehave, there's going to be correction that comes their way from me, a loving father who wants to guide them and direct them in the right way. We you know what I'm not going to do is kick them out of the family. Right. right. I'm not going to go stick them in an oven. Right. That's exactly what people get this idea that we're saying that or that, 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 you know, if somehow if we misbehave, God's going to cast us off. Right. You know, and send us to hell. His own children. So I'm not saying you can live this life without consequences. You're going to suffer the consequences of God's chastening. Here's the thing, though. He's not going to send you to hell. Right. Amen. Because you're his child. Because you've been born again Amen. by faith. Amen. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. <clears throat> Where did I have you turn, John? Uh, Where Galatians. Galatians. The Bible says in Galatians chapter 6, look at verse 7. Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that uh, shall all, he shall all, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. So right there again, whatever you sow, that's what you're going to reap in this life. There are consequences for your behavior. But your behavior is not what determines whether or not you go to heaven. What determines whether or not you go to heaven is whether you have believed on the Son or you have not. He that believeth on the Son hath life. He that believeth not the Son hath not life. Amen. But the wrath of God abideth on him. Now, one particular false teacher that I want to focus in on, or one false gospel that is preached across many denominations, is that you must be baptized in order to be saved. That's why I'm bringing it up, because we're having a baptism. And I always like to clarify what baptism is and what it isn't and why we have the name Baptist on there. Because baptism, believe it or not, is a very important document. One false pro uh, gospel that teaches we must is that we must be baptized to be, be, be saved. What they call this is baptismal regeneration. You probably heard that. Baptismal regeneration. And that's defined as uh, it is the name given to doctrines held by major Christian denominations which maintain that salvation is intimately linked to the act of baptism. So if you believe in a baptismal regeneration, you're saying there's, you cannot go to heaven, you cannot be saved without baptism playing a part in it. And, the, and the, this is taught in uh, the Roman Catholicism, the Orthodox Church, the Lutheran Church, the Anglican Church, the Methodist Church, the Reformed Church, the Latter-day Saints, and the Church of Christ. Yep. And it's all a works-based salvation. But you, there's something you have to do. You have to be baptized. You have to do this. You have to do X, Y, and Z. And therefore, you are trusting in your own works at that point. And your faith is not entirely on Christ. <clears throat> and today, I want to focus on just one of those, which is the Church of Christ. The Church of Christ. Now, I went. Now, the Church of Christ is kind of a hard group to kind of nail down because they... Though they say they are a denomination, though they say they aren't a denomination, they really don't have a, a necessarily a central headquarters. It's hard to kind of, you know, nail down a specific website or page that you can go to and say this is their official doctrine. But they are out there, and they kind of all believe the same things generally. And when it comes to baptism, I found a reputable website where it explains what they believe, especially on this topic of baptism. 
So reading from their page, it says, emphasis on baptism. This is one of the things that they believe. It says, churches of Christ have a reputation for placing much stress on the need for baptism. Now, mind you, this is the Church of Christ speaking. They are the ones that said that. However, we do not emphasize baptism as a church ordinance, but as a command of Christ. The New Testament, this is them teaching. This is what they believe. The New Testament teaches baptism as an act which is essential to salvation. That's what they said. They are saying that salvation, that baptism is essential to salvation. And then they quote, they just reference, they don't even quote it, Mark 16, Acts 2, and Acts 22, verse 16. Now, whenever you're seeing anybody reference Scripture, you want to turn there and actually read it. Right. Yep. That's how you avoid false doctrine, by, by actually opening up the Bible and reading it and seeing what it has to say. Amen. <clears throat> because again, you know, that's our final authority, is the Bible. And if you take away the Bible, I don't have a leg to stand on. All right. If you're going to say, well, my authority is not the Bible, then you're right. I, I, you know, I have, I have nothing to argue with you. But my, the Bible is my final authority. Nah. Whatever the Bible says, that's what I'm going to believe. Yeah. <clears throat> so they reference the Bible. Well, I'm glad that they've decided to reference the Bible because now we can go to it and we can read it for what it says and compare it to what they're saying and see if the two are lining up. Look in Mark chapter 16. Mark chapter 16. Mark chapter 16 and verse 15. <clears throat> the Bible says, Jesus speaking, He said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Verse 16. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. That's not where it ends though, does it? No. It goes on and says, But he that believeth not shall be damned. So and if you've ever run into a Church of Christ person out trying to preach the gospel to them, you'll see they'll quote that. Well, you know, the Bible says, Mark 16, this is their go-to verse. Yep. It's the first one this guy quoted in his article. It says right there, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Now, if you just kind of read that over without really thinking the truth, especially in light of the rest of the verse, the rest of that sentence, in fact, you might walk away saying that you have to be believed, and that believing is not enough, but that you also must be baptized. But here's the thing, we have to understand, what exa is, that, is that really true? What if I were to say to you, he that believeth and chews bubblegum shall be saved? Is that a true statement? I mean, I could say, because we know that salvation is by grace through faith, it's by belief alone. I mean, go read John, go read the Gospel of John. Believe, 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 he that believeth, over and over and over again. <clears throat> I can say anything. He that believeth and eat, you know, and eats a ham sandwich shall be saved. He that believeth and does a cartwheel shall be saved. Every one of those is a true statement. Yeah, right. Because it has the essential part of salvation. He that believeth. That's why the rest of that verse goes on and reads, But he that believeth not shall be damned. It doesn't mention baptism. It doesn't say he that believeth not and fails to get baptized is damned. It says the person that, that is damned has not done the one thing that we must do. And what is that? What was the one thing we must do? What did they tell the Philippian jailer when he came in and fell before their feet and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? What must I do? What did he say to them? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Amen. And that was it. He didn't say believe and do this and believe and do that and believe and do this. It was that one thing, which is to believe. <clears throat> So that, that argument doesn't, you can't reference Mark 16 and say, well, baptism is essential for salvation. That verse proves it that it's not. Because it says, he that believeth not shall not, it, uh, he that believeth not shall be dead, not he that fails to be baptized. So that's irony defined right there, that their primary verse is actually teaching opposite of what they're teaching. And we could go on through, here, uh, through what they quote in Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, if you want to get over there quickly, Acts chapter 2, verse 36. This is what they reference. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made the same Jesus whom He have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their hearts and said unto uh, Peter to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Did they say, what must we do? What should we do? What shall we do? Verse 38, this is where they get their doctrine. Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of, the, of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the Holy Ghost. Now, should we repent? Should yes. we repent of sin? Yeah. Yeah. That's something we should do. Should we be baptized? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, we should. Must we be, do these things in order to be saved? No. Again, what was that question asked by the Philippian, Philippian jailer? What must I do? Not what shall I do? 
And really, we could even prove this further if you can go to Acts chapter 16. Acts chapter 16. This isn't the first time that Peter brings up this idea of having your sins remitted. Having your sins going to remission. I'm sorry, I already quoted that. Acts 16 verse 30 where it says, you can see it for yourself. And he brought, out, uh, brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved and thy house. So really what Peter is doing there in Acts chapter 2 when he's telling them to repent, which is, you know, that's a whole other sermon in and of itself. That repent means to turn from unbelief to belief. That's what he's telling the Jews there. They've rejected Christ. And he's saying, stop rejecting Him. Repent. That word literally means turn. And turn to Christ. All right. Go from unbelief to belief. And be baptized. What he's doing, he's killing two, he's killing two birds with one stone. Well, hey, since you guys asked, you should repent and you should be baptized. And he could have gone on with a lot of other things we should do. But these are not the things that we must do. <clears throat> but again, as I was mentioning, go to Acts chapter, sin, uh, Acts chapter 10. Peter is killing two birds with, stone, with, with, with one stone. And he talks about the remission of sins. It said there, he said, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. Right? Well, Acts chapter 10, verse 43, he brings up this remission again. To him give all the prophets witness, speaking of Christ, that through his name, whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. So what's telling what, what's he, right there he's saying, he that believeth on him shall receive remission of sins. No, no talk of baptism. No, no talk of that. Right? Just he that believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. If you want to have your sins remitted, if you want to go to heaven, the one thing you have to do is to believe on Christ. You say that's too easy. I know that's why it takes a humble person to believe it. Right. Yeah. Because the proud man wants to work his way to heaven. Yeah. He wants to, they, will, they want to stand before him and say, Lord, Lord, have we not done many wonderful works in thy name? Yeah. And he'll say, I never knew you. Right. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Yeah. Have we not cast out devils in thy name, and in thy name done many wonderful works? Yeah, you tried to work your way there, and you can't. Amen. Right. One thing you have to do is believe. Well, that's too easy. For God so Amen. loved the world. If God loves us, He'd make it easy to go to heaven. Yeah, that's right. He wouldn't make it hard. You know, if I wanted my children to come to me and I love them, would I put them many obstacles in their way and say, come here, get under that barbed wire, go through that mud pit, keep your heads down while I fire a rifle over you and make it difficult for them to come to me? No, I'd clear the way, I'd make the, the, make the, the path as smooth and straight as I could, and I'd get down on my knees and with open arms, call to them, come to me. Right. And that's exactly what God does with us when He says, just believe. Amen. Christ came and He died for us. He's already done all the hard work. There's nothing left for us to do but to believe. Amen. 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 And we could go through this chapter and point out the sequence of what takes place there, but we need to move on for sake of time. <clears throat> they go on in their article and it says, we do not practice infant baptism because the New Testament baptism is for sinners who turn to the Lord in belief and penitence, an infant has no sin to repent of and cannot qualify as a believer. Now I will say the Church of Christ is correct to not baptize infants. The Bible does not teach infant baptism. But again, if the Bible is not your authority, you can teach whatever you want on this subject. But here the Bible is our final authority. We turn to it to see where what we believe. If you would, go to Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8. They say it's for sinners. And then they say it's for believers. And they're kind of contradicting themselves. Right? Because we believe here that salvation or that baptism is something that happens to a person after they put their faith in Christ and already receive salvation. Yep. You know, that's not something that they're doing in order to be saved, they're doing it because they have been saved. <clears throat> you see that in Acts chapter 8. And by the way, that's something only an adult can do. You can't have an infant go, you know, do you believe you're a sinner? Do you believe Jesus Christ is God? Do you believe He died for your sins? Do you believe He was buried and rose again? Are you putting all your faith in Him? They're not going to mouth back, I do, and then pray a sinner's prayer with you. Right. You have to come to an age. You have to grow and spiritually come to an age where you can understand these things in order to even, even to be saved. <coughs> but look there in Acts chapter 8, verse 35. Let's see an example of baptism. Then Philip opened his mouth and began the same Scripture and preached unto him Jesus. And as they went on their way, they came unto a certain water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? He's saying, Why can't I be baptized, Peter? And, or Philip, and, he, and Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. Yeah. And 
he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And that was his salvation right there. Amen. And that's the perfect picture of, of soul winning right there. Someone coming right. to an un lost unbeliever right. who doesn't understand stand the Scripture, opening up the Word of God. In this case, he took him to a, the book of Isaiah and explaining to him what the Scripture says about salvation. They believe it. If thou believest, he said, I believe. And then he is baptized. And he commanded the chariot to stand still. And they went both. Uh, they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized them. So again, this is a person who's come to Christ and is then baptized. They've already believed. They've already received salvation, and are being baptized. Now again, it's it's you know we have an example of baptism. Why don't we practice uh, you know sprinkling as Baptists? Why don't why isn't we just pour a ladle? You know, why is it instead of taking the time to fill up a horse trough, which isn't exactly the most glamorous thing to be baptized, but praise God, I was baptized in one. Right. My wife was baptized in one. And several of you in here have been baptized in one, and we're going to baptize another one. That's right. Amen. Amen. You know, why, why go through all the trouble of that when we could just take one of these prizes I gave you and just... <laughs> <laughs> in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> and I, I could baptize this whole room in just a few minutes. <clears throat> well, it's because of that verse right there where it says... And they went both down into the water. Yep. I mean, why does he make a stop the chariot? Come on down, let's walk down the water. But he said, Oh, you want to get baptized? Do you believe? Oh, I'll be right back. Grabbed a cup, came back, and just <laughs> He could have done that. I mean, why, is why is it that John baptized in uh, in Jordan near uh Bainon near Salem, if I'm getting the geography correct, yep. it says there uh, because there was much water there. That's right. You know why? Because he was baptizing thousands of people. And how was he baptizing? The same way Jesus Christ was baptized in Matthew chapter 2. When he was in straightway when he came up out of the water. Right? So in order to go come up out of the water, you have to go down into the water. Yeah. Amen. So that's why we practice full immersion of an adult who has already believed. Because that is the biblical biblical examples that we see. <clears throat> um so I'm gonna I'm gonna move on here for, for sake of time and try to get through this. But uh, <clears throat> they go on in their article and they say the only form of baptism we practice in the churches of Christ is immersion. The Greek word from which the word baptize comes means to dip, immerse, to submerge, to plunge. And that's why the Greek Orthodox, they've at least got that part of it right. Well they're still doing infant baptism, which is unbiblical, you won't find that in scripture, but they're at least dunking them, right? And if you've ever seen the Facebook video where they're doing like, like this, I mean, apparently they've never heard of shaken baby syndrome. Right? And it's a real thing. It's out there. I, mean, I couldn't believe this. I mean, who would just hand over the kid and just let him just plunge? I'm sure they don't all do that. But that guy did. I mean, the fir after that first dunk, I would have been, Whoa, buddy, give him back. That's all right. There's another Orthodox church down the street. Maybe the guy's a little bit, little less zealous about, about dunking the babies, but... He says, the only form we practice in churches of Christ is immersion. The Greek word from uh, which the word baptize comes means to dip, immerse, submerge, to plunge. And the scripture always points to baptism as a burial. Now that's, that's a strong statement to say that baptism is always pointing to a burial. And they go on and they quote Acts 8, Romans 6, and Colossians 12. They reference it. Well, we already read Acts 8. Did you guys read about anything about a burial in there? Was there, a, was there a hearse? Did I miss something when we no. just read in Acts 8.35 where there was a procession and there was some kind of a burial taking place? People were mourning, dressed in black, flowers. There was nothing like that. So to sit there and say it, Scripture always points to baptism as a burial, that's false. <clears throat> but they do conveniently, if you would, I should have you stay there in Colossians chapter 2. <clears throat> they conveniently begin in verse 12 of Colossians despite it being part of a sentence that starts in verse 10. They want to say, Buried with him in baptism, learn, uh, ye also are not, also you are risen. See? Baptism is a burial. But you got to back up because that's, you know, that's part of a sentence. And, and there's this thing called context that we have to get. It says in, in, in verse 10, And ye are complete in him. All right? that's, a, that's a great statement right there. You know, how, how do I know I'm going to heaven? Because I'm complete in Christ. Yeah. Right because I don't, I don't need to do anything else outside of His death, burial, and resurrection. But put my faith in that. Which is the head of all principality and power. In whom, verse 11, also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, and putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with Him in baptism, wherein ye are also risen uh, with Him through the faith of the operation of God who hath raised Him from the dead. 
So what is Paul saying here to the Colossians? Basically, he's boiling it down to say this, that baptism is a picture of salvation. That's what he's saying. Well, how do you know that? Because he compares it with circumcision, the previous right. verse. So if you're going to say, well, you got to be baptized, I mean, do you want to go the next step further? Right. And say, well, circumcision is part of it now too? I mean, you just blotted out 53% of the, the population. But you know that, that's he's comparing it to circumcision, then he compares it. And what is it? What is the comparison? It's as if they're putting off the sins of the flesh, being separated from your sins, being circumcised, made without hands, in Christ, complete in Him. That's, that is uh, the picture that he's drawing there. And he goes on and he uses that illustration. He, he uses another illustration. He further develops that point by saying, buried with Him in baptism. So baptism is just a picture of salvation as, as much as circumcision is. You know, uh, we are circumcised, we are buried, and we are risen through faith in Christ. We don't, we don't do these things in order to be saved. We do these things because we are saved. Amen. Go to 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3. I know I had to turn a lot of places this morning, but it's important to know these doctrines and to see these things with your own eyes in the Scripture. Romans 6, verse 3 says this, Know ye not, you're in 1 Peter 3, I'll read from Romans 6. Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into His death. Therefore we are buried with Him by baptism into death. That like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Now again, we should walk in newness of life because we are baptized and buried with Him in death. It doesn't say we have to. It's not something we must do. But again, this is something where he's, he's just using it as an illustration. We are buried with Christ by faith. We're not literally buried. You know, it's a picture. <clears throat> and baptism is that picture of it. It's the picture of us being, back, of being buried with Christ in His death. We're identifying with it. We're saying to those around us, I believe that Jesus Christ died for my sins, yep. was buried, and rose again. All my faith is in that. That's what baptism is. It's a picture of those things, of, of what's in the heart, of what you have believed. Amen. Just as much as your wedding ring is a picture of the of the relationship that you have with your spouse. People can look at I lost mine, so forgive me. <laughs> but hey, here's the thing. I don't have mine on. Does that mean I'm no longer married? Yeah. Just because I don't have my wedding ring off? You take your wedding ring off, are you suddenly unmarried? No. Well, that what does that represent, though? It represents the fact that you are you are you have vowed yourself to another, that you're you're bound in matrimony to that person. But it's just a picture of it. It's not matrimony itself. That isn't the vows. It's the fact that you've just made those vows, and your other people can look at it and say that person is married. That person is not married, <clears throat> unless he lost his wedding ring. <laughs> but that's the point I'm trying to make. Is that's all baptism is? It's just a picture. It's just a symbol, like your wedding ring. You're saying, hey, I, I believed in Christ, that He died for my sins. I'm not trusting my own works. I'm trusting in Him. Amen. Amen. When we trust Christ for salvation, we're putting our faith in His death, yep. His burial, and His resurrection. The Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 21, the like figure whereunto even baptism doth also now save us. Not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience towards God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now you can see why the Church of Christ would turn turn to this and say, "Well, you see, baptism is necessary for salvation." Because it might, I mean, if you just kind of glance over that again, but you have again, you have to get this in the context of the entire New Testament, the entire Bible, in fact, and kind of break this down and try to understand what's really being said. What saves us, according to this verse? This Bible, this verse tells us exactly how we're saved, how we go to heaven. And here's a hint: drop the parentheses, right? Because that's just a that's a sub that's a thought within a thought that's right. going on there. And we read it again like this. The like figure to whereunto even baptism doth also, doth, doth also now save us. How? By the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Amen. How is it that baptism saves you? By the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Because you're identifying with that. When you're buried and you come up out of the water, you're identifying with it. You're just saying, I, I, you, I, you're just showing us what you've already done. It's not your baptism that saved you. It's the resurrection of Christ that saved you. Right. That He died, was buried, and rose again. <laughs> so baptism saves us only in the sense that it represents the answer of a good conscience towards God. That's the only way. It's just a picture. It's just you showing you uh, us what you believe. <laughs> and this is kind of a, a longer point, but 
Baptism can't save you or give you a good conscience towards God any more than the Old Testament sacrifices could. I mean, if those Old Testament sacrifices could have saved us, why did it have to stop? Why couldn't that just continue? But when they were doing that, they have always understood that that was simply a picture of Christ to come. Even Abraham understood that. When he took Isaac up on the mount, and, and, and his son says to him, Lord, here's the wood, but where is the offering? Yeah. And what did he say to him? God shall provide for himself a lamb. Amen. And that lamb didn't come on that mount. If you recall the story, it was a ram that he found. And that was prophetic, what, what, what he was saying there, that it was a lamb that would be provided. That is right. a picture of Christ. And they always understood that. And you can find that in Hebrews chapter 9. <clears throat> The Bible says in Hebrews 9, verse 14, How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through him the eternal Spirit offered Himself without spot to God, purge your conscience? <clears throat> you see, I'm not going to heaven today because I got baptized. Right. I'm going to heaven today because the blood of Christ yeah. is what gave me, purged me, made me clean without spot before God. And in order to be saved, you know, there, there are three elements to salvation. Let me give you what they are. The death burial and resurrection of Christ. Amen. Amen. Those are the three those are the three elements of salvation. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 15, for I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. It's his death, it's his burial, it's his resurrection that I'm trusting in. Amen. Not my baptism. That's what's going to get me into heaven. That's what's going to wash away all my sins. The fact that I got wet. Or is it the fact that I'm identifying and showing everybody around me the faith that I have in my heart that Jesus Christ died for my sins. Amen. That Jesus Christ was buried. And that Jesus Christ rose again. <clears throat> it goes on in this article and says, Baptism is extremely important in the New Testament because it sets forth the following purposes to enter the kingdom. He said, you have to be baptized to enter the kingdom. He said, Jesus, and he, they turn to John chapter 3, verse 5. Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. <clears throat> so it kind of sounds like it. You've got to be born of the water and of the Spirit. But that doesn't say you must be baptized born of the Spirit, does it? Right. But they, they misconstrue that. They think, well, water, uh, baptism must be what he's talking about. But that's not at all what he's talking about. He goes on and explains exactly what he's talking about. Verse 6, that which is born of the flesh right. is flesh. And that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. So he's comparing, the, you know, you have in verse 5, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit. Verse 6, you have the flesh and the Spirit. So it only stands to reason that being born of water is being born of flesh. And I've ex tried to explain this to Mormons at the door and they laughed in my face. And say, so you, think, you think that uh, and because I told him, I said, look, the Bible, all he's teaching is here that you have to be born of your mother. Yes. You have to be born of the flesh. Water. You know, and the water broke, exactly. You were in a sack of water. Ha, ha, ha. And they just laugh and they mock at that. How else do you explain it? That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. The preceding verse is that which is born of water. Right. That which is born of the spirit. You must right. be born of the water and of the spirit. Think about it. If you weren't born of your mother, you have no need to be born again. Right. Right? It's like that old joke. You know, having children is genetic. If your parents didn't have any, neither will you. Right. It's the same thing. <clears throat> we have to be born of our mother, and then we're born of the Spirit. That's why Jesus said you must be born again. Mm -hmm. So he's not talking about baptism there. When he's saying you must be born of the water. He's just referring to the fact that, hey, you were born of your mother, now you need to be born of the Spirit. Except a man be born again, he cannot, cannot enter the kingdom. <clears throat> and here's the bottom line. You say, oh, I'm, I'm not sure about that. Well, here's the bottom line. The Bible is my final authority. And the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, for by grace, grace is something you don't deserve, for by grace are you saved through what? Through faith, through what you believe, not what you do. Yeah. For by grace are you saved through faith. Then it goes on and says, that not of yourselves. It's not about what you do. It's not about your good works. It's not, not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. It's saying that it's a gift, that you don't do any works at all. And let me ask you, is baptism a work? You bet it is. Uh, you know, first you got to tell somebody you want to get baptized. They're going to check you out on your salvation, make sure you believe on Christ and understand the gospel. And then you actually have to show up and do it publicly in front of everybody. 
And people will go, and, he, and some of us are much more extrovert than others, and we take this for granted. What's the big deal? It's just baptism. Some people have an innate fear of getting up in front of people, standing in front of people, having anybody look at them more than for a few seconds outside of a conversation. Some people are very introverted. And being baptized, being dunked underwater in front of a group of strangers can be very intimidating. Right. And that's why people can get saved and go their whole life and never do it. But let me tell you, if they go their whole life and never get baptized, if they believed on Christ, that person's going to heaven. Amen. Because baptism is not essential for salvation, despite all the false doctrine that's surrounding it out there today. <clears throat> it takes work. It takes effort to be baptized. And salvation is not of works, lest any man should boast. That's what the Bible clearly teaches. It can't be both. The Bible says, if by grace, then it is no more works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then it is no more grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. And so, you say, why preach on baptism? You know, you preached on this not too long ago. Why bring it up again? Because I get excited about baptism. Amen. I, get, I do. I'm a Baptist. Amen. Excuse me. I get, a, I get a little excited about baptism. Yeah. Because it's an important doctrine. Right. right. And it's something that our Baptist forefathers went to the stake over. Right. Yep. There was a time that, that to get up and preach a sermon like this and to deny and to teach the truth of baptism would cost you your life. Right. There was a season in this world, there was a time in this world, a place in this world where that happened. And a lot of blood has been shed over this doctrine. All right. Mm -hmm. And we shouldn't take it for granted. And also, we shouldn't let some false gospel rob us of the joy of baptism. I, I, I get excited about baptism because it reminds me of what Christ did for me. Amen. When I see somebody else getting baptized, I think back to my own baptism. I think about the, And I start to think about the fact that Christ did all the same things for me that they did for that person. That He came and lived a perfect and sinless life so that I didn't have to. That He gave His life so I wouldn't have to. That He died and was buried and rose again. And that all I have to do is believe in that and I see somebody else being baptized and it fills my heart with joy Amen. to see that. Right. The Bible says in Acts chapter 2, and they... Then they that gladly received his word were baptized. There's joy involved in the baptism and receiving Christ and being baptized. And we rejoice in baptism because we understand its true purpose and meaning. When we understand its true purpose and its true meaning, we rejoice because we, by faith, have been buried with Christ in his death and we know that we will be raised again in his likeness. Let's go ahead and pray.